Anger by Alexander Augustus Narrated by Daniel Collard Volume 2, Chapter 2 My four mouths and eight lungs inhaled deeply, and we began to row. Each self gripped two arms of the star man, and with these I did row, with the long bones lodged in the ribcage of the ghost ship. I rowed for a period of over two score and nine days, through the darkness, searching for land. The phantoms flocking after my light did each dissolve into the deep darkness. Thunder rolled, and lightning threw up momentary silhouettes in the distance. My eight eyes navigated using these flashes of vision. Eventually, I saw some metal structures jutting out from the sea. Not quite buildings, more like a ghostly pier. We travelled towards it. Atop the pier were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. Their heads and hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and their eyes were as flames of fire. They had on their heads crowns of gold, encrusted with the disembodied milk teeth of children, gleaming like pearls. These elders too had faces akin to cups, but they were haggard and battle-worn, and from the pier proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. I called out, piercing the wind and rain with my voices. Good sirs! Where might I find phone, money and keys so I might survive this harsh place? In the right hand of one of the elders was a book. Key stage three German. The study guide was written thereon. The elders too had books on diverse topics. Maths, chemistry, English literature. The closest elder turned to me and shrieked through the darkness. Cup hath resigned. We hold great anger and great judgment. The time of the dead is cometh that they should be judged, and he who is worthy to pass their exams should go forth and join the war against the blue, to destroy them which hath destroyed Cup from within. I let loose my oars and stood with all my bodies, grinning light towards the pier. I remembered not resignation. I remembered only finding treasures, eating, and life-giving air rushing into my lungs. But I chose to humour the Elder regardless. And what devil hath destroyed Cup? And what is the blue? All the Elders now turned to me and spake with one voice. The beast yonder! All four and twenty Elders lifted their bony index fingers and pointed in entirely different directions. The beast doth float and move! His height is thirty cubits and a span! His weight is ten thousand and thousands of thousands of shekels! The elders cowered in horror and then continued, The giant beast assumes the likeness of cup as it floats under the water, and it doth breathe of the water and eat the beasts of the water. Upon its head a great tail of a fox twitcheth and paddleth, Upon its forehead the name of blasphemy! And there was given unto the beast a mouth, speaking blasphemies with a voice of many waters, and power was given unto it to continue forty and two months. And we saw it wounded to death by the neck, and its deadly wound was healed. The terrible hanged beast, it hath slain us all!
It doesn't sound so tough. Who might challenge this beast? I asked, joshing and jostling between my bodies, as if to show myself up in front of the teacher. The elders replied indignantly, The sea gave forth the things which were in it, and they will be judged as worthy according to the key stage three syllabus. Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him using key stage three? Before I could question further about this blue, a particularly shrill elder, who had been crawling about the pier, measuring its beams and bolts with a golden reed, suddenly cried, Hark! A candidate cometh! Come and see! Come and see! And I beheld, lo, in the midst of the pier, between its rusty legs, a young pink cup did swim from some stray group. All four and twenty elders bent over crooked and bellowed down to the young cup. Hark, candidate! Stop chewing! Commence exam one! Thou should kicketh this ball into that goal! And an elder with a whistle around his neck did throw a ball into the tumultuous waters, which did bob and spin. Panicking and struggling, the young child did beg, Phone? Mun? He was swallowing seawater and spluttering, treading water in exhaustion. But he... Keys? Bara mana? Conan? Bowl? Screamed the first elder, adjusting the distance of his reading spectacles and tracing the words in his German textbook with his finger. Spielen! The child did look up to myself in confusion, and I did smile and beam sunshine down onto his endeavours. It's, it's okay, okay, little one. one. Be, Be brave, brave, I said. I noticed a number of serpents tied in knots to the posts of the pier. They were humongous beasts, thick as tree trunks, and bound in a jumbled tangle to the rusted metal frame. They snapped at the child when rough waves did push him from the center of the arena, preventing his escape. The candidate paddled towards the bull. He grabbed at it with desperate hands, but couldn't hold it. A wave broke over the top of his head, knocking him sideways and dipping him under. As he coughed and spluttered, waves slammed his head into one of the rusted metal posts of the pier. Blood diluted in seawater did stream from those wounds which did hurt the boy. His little hands pushed at the ball as he struggled, and a river of blood covered his left eye like a mask. He swam forth, twirling and bobbing as his little legs kicked. All the while the wicked elders did poke at him, criticizing his form and commenting, No, no, this runt will never do, sissy child! The child's blood-soaked eyes betrayed something like disbelief. The little boy slapped at the ball, pounding it into a space between the pier legs. He turned once again to the elders while paddling in exhaustion. <laughs> Phone? He asked while gurgling blood and seawater. Thou kicketh not! The elders snarled wickedly with eyes inflamed. Handball! Handball! screeched the elder who had dropped the ball, punctuating his cries with blows on his whistle. With a wave of the hand, like a conductor, a weary elder perched atop a domed seat instructed the snakes to pin the child. The serpents snapped and pulled at Little Cup's arms and legs to keep him still. The elder with the golden reed hung over the side of the pier, he produced a set of golden pliers from under his raiment and clamped down on one of the child's front teeth. With much tribulation and violence, he ripped a tooth from the writhing child with a crack. The child wailed and cried in agony, looking again to my eight flaming eyes. The elder did eat this tooth and the tooth did then grow atop his crown like an enamelled treasure amongst tens of thousands and thousands of thousands of others. The child, a stream with blood and seawater, did continue the examinations, failing each test one by one and wailing into the storm as each of his teeth were ripped from his skull. 
With every test he grew more clumsy, more dazed in movement. But the shame smouldering within him grew more potent. I did allow this torture to continue, and I did salivate at the potency of his shame. I remember, I thought as I watched the shame brim from the child. I remember now how it all works. Finally, the elders declared, The, the candidate, candidate is a failure! failure. He, he cannot, cannot wage war on our behalf. behalf. He, he cannot face, face the beast. The beast. Place, Place him with, with the, the others. others. They clamped down on the child's nose with the golden pliers and sliced it off with a single stroke of the golden reed. As the light in the child's eyes faded, his fingers and facial features did twitch and pulsate. The snakes lifted his limp body from the water and dumped him onto a pile of blood-soaked, toothless and noseless little cups, which numbered tens of hundreds and hundreds of thousands. One of the elders did eat the nose also, and this nose did appear with a multitude of others atop his crown. Observing all this, I approached the elders. Does the beast of which you tell hold the phone, money and keys I seek? The elders conferred, and after much deliberation turned back to us. We hold great anger and great judgement. Only he who is worthy to pass the exams can question us. With that, I docked my skeleton ship to the pier by lashing the star man's raiment around one of its legs. The elders winced as I climbed my bodies up the pier like bonfire flames propelled upwards by their own heat. Approach us not! They cried, wielding the golden reed and golden pliers. I placed my hands about the face of the elder who had thrown the ball down to the child. I asked him once more, Kind, kind sir, sir, will, will you, you relate, relate to me the information, information I, I seek? My grip tightened, and with arms flailing, the elder called out to his brothers in panic, How dare he! His head was beading with sweat under the burning light of my smiling, flashing face, moistening my hands. I have a few things against thee, I explained before I bit through his nose, slicing the soft tissue between my teeth, clamping down on the cartilage. I ripped it from his skull in a fountain of blood. His legs and arms flailed as he reached for his brothers in desperation, but they fled to the edges of the pier. My selves weaved and danced after them like sparks in the wind. I ripped this elder's tongue out also, and nestled both his nose and tongue in my hair. I did think to myself, Enemies of my enemies are indeed my friends, and these articles may buy me good favour. Gripping a clump of his white hair in one hand, and manoeuvring my arm around his neck, I placed the elder in a headlock, forcing my fist into his bleeding mouth, then down his throat which expanded like a Chinese finger trap. I pushed it deep within his stomach. I grasped for some stray nodule of intestine or organ to rip back out through his mouth, which I did find, and pulled him inside out. I twisted his head, thereby snapping his neck, and continued to rotate it until most of the elastic skin had corkscrewed off, liberating his head from his body entirely. With a beaming smile, I kicked this like a football over to myself, who leapt up to header it into the pile of children's corpses. I blew the whistle and waved to the other scrambling elders. Stop! 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 Screamed the other elders as they clambered to the edges of the pier, over pylons and weaving through the iron supports. One of them turned back and shrieked in disgust, these animals even recite the tenets of basic arithmetic? Can the beasts recite the periodic table? Can the beasts even spell? Can they spell thumb for us? T-H-U! Our eyes smouldered like coals, and faces flashed as we roared as a terrible quartet. Silence! Upon my head, the name of mischief 
and I play not by your rules. All four of my tetrarchy did hold the structure of the pier with smouldering and smoking hands, which did heat the pier into a magma red, until the elders were hopping and howling with pain. Look how they dance! I smirked. Come and see! Come and see! I laughed with four voices. I lowered my heads to the snakes in the sea, who did number three and who had snapped at the child and had hurt many cup children. Upon, Upon your foreheads are the, are the names of phone, phone money, money and keys? And keys? I interrogated. I had little memory of these articles from London, but I was sure they inhabited not the form of serpents. No, masters, they hissed. Upon our foreheads there are no names. We are humble beasts from the ocean. The elders, numbering four and twenty, did tie our tails and held us captive, feeding us not and freeing us not. We starve. In a terrifying way, they were elegant beasts, shining like gold chains in the light I bathed them in. The serpents lifted their tangled tails revealing a series of tight knots such as one might look upon in the midst of a jewellery box. A glittering pile of treasures, I thought. Yes, I must collect them. If, if I untie you, you will you, will you promise, promise to do, to do no harm to myself? Do, do you promise, promise to navigate this ocean, ocean? And, and even, even if, if I place my bodies within, within your throats, throats not, not to swallow, swallow us? us? Yes, sirs. We are as old as the ocean itself. If you untie us, we will take you to the blue and to the treasures you seek. We can take you to the giant beast of which they did speak. We can even show you land, but alas, we know not where are the phone, money and keys. Very well. I exclaimed, impressed with their honesty. My four bodies knelt down to release the serpents of their bondage. Upon your foreheads be the names of Knife, Fork and Spoon, for this was the only trio of names I had in my mind. Once free, Knife, Fork and Spoon wrapped around one another and rotated majestically, cantilevering themselves upwards to skim the water's surface standing upright almost like humans. They were three times my height, with wide, scaled bodies encrusted with stones that flashed as topaz. They continued to speak as they rotated through the air. Thank you for releasing us from the grips of these elders, good sirs. I turned eight flaming eyes back to the remaining three and twenty elders who were cowering on the pile of dead and damaged children at the furthest part of the pier. Does, Does the, the heart, heart of the, the child, child you tortured, tortured still beat? beat? My four voices roared into the petrified night. Yes! Yes! yes. yes. The elders trembled. Good! Good. Feed, Feed him, him the head, head of your, your fallen, fallen companion. companion. The elders kneeled and sobbed as they did crack their companion's head open like a coconut and fed it to the child in messy, clumped handfuls of brain matter. The child received the meal, sitting up as strength returned to his body. I said, Feed the rest of him to the child. The elders did as I commanded, flaying the skin with the golden pliers, stripping the muscles from the bone with the golden reed. The child was still weak, but active enough now to reach for the handfuls of flesh and feed himself with them. Very good, I beamed. Now, feed yourselves to the child. With this command, the elderly men tried to scramble away, but the snakes did pin them down and drag them back one by one. Some elders did help to carve up their brothers, whilst begging that their own lives be spared. Others did try to stall or distract, 
with bits of knowledge from their Key Stage 3 textbooks. But the child did clamp down with the golden pliers, and cut and slice with the golden reed, and he ate and ate until he grew stronger. Their eyeballs he did swallow whole, so that he would see with the eyes of the elders. These did travel through his body, and resurface under the skin, and his skin did split in these places, so that the eyes might see. The elders' blood did now pump through the child's veins, and he took on their anger, which did now mingle with his own shame, like oil on a fire. He did not age as I had done, but remained as a child, and with each bite his flesh did sprout another eye in his soft body, until he was full of eyes all around. I chuckled light down upon him as he feasted. Once the elders were all eaten, I commanded the child to eat the tens of hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of bodies of his own fallen brothers. This he did, and with each gulp he devoured more of the livid shame of his fallen kin. The elders were very much alive in his cells and pumping through his veins, as were the souls of his fallen brothers, and for each of them a new eye opened. The child's skin blushed bright red like a seraphim. My next command was to eat the pier itself, with its strong bolts, rims and spokes, iron beams and support struts. The child did so, and as he ate, he transformed again. His ribs did fuse and separate into intricate iron rings, the rims of which, and their spokes and wheels, were full of eyes all around. He now appeared to be made like a wheel intersecting myriad other wheels. Their rims were high and awesome, and all the rims were full of eyes all around. The child's innards were exposed and hung within the inner ring, but his head remained fully formed, with only his nose and teeth missing. My four bodies now turned to each other, nodded, and kneeled at the feet of the fantastic and terrible child. Dear child, may your terrible shame and burning anger motivate our path to phone, money and keys, and along the way, possibly also to the great cup of tea. The child's hundreds of thousands and thousands of thousands of eyes blinked in acknowledgement. His eye-encrusted wheels and rims began to spin and rotate faster and faster, propelling him high above the surface of the water. I offer to share my own flame, so you may rise and light my journey, and so I may share your eyes. We will become one being, and through my eyes you may see, and through your eyes I may see. The four of my bodies held hands for one final time. I addressed the terrible child. This is my body, which is given for you. One of my bodies lurched forward into the child's slicing rims and spokes. They did cut me into small pieces, bursting and flaming with light. The child did pick at my flesh with golden pliers and eat it like diced, stewing beef. With each gulp, the child did transform once more. My countenance did glow in his eyes and his mouth and his wheels. The child did eat the pieces of myself, and the air did shiver around us with each bite. Our beings merged into one another. My hot flesh passed into the child's. The weft of my sinews and tendons unfurled into the child's structure. My blood did rush into and around the child's system. My organs, chewed up and swallowed, did merge with the boy's innards, and my limbs grew into his limbs. Our eyes fused, retinas joining and images overlaying. I saw everything around me, with tens of hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of eyes. My own eyes, and the child's eyes which were now my own. Feeling began to rush into my new body, like the sensation that pours back into a numb limb which has had the blood flow restricted in slumber. I moved my new rings, I spun them, and I did open and close all my eyes and roll them back in their respective sockets, and with each roll of each eye I did remember each of the abuses I had suffered. 
And with each roll of the eye came a click or a tick, like unto an unstable bomb. It was like moving one of my own body parts, only the part was severed and moved quite independently. And my mind was thrown into chaos instantaneously, and shame swept through my mischief, and mischief swept through my shame. And shame did shoot through me with terrible rage, and mischief crunched against the shame with which I now burned. I was pulled to my knees, my throats tightened and arrested, my stomachs boiling with bile, and from this disunity burst great energy and rage and rebelliousness. But most importantly, the inner conflict birthed an ambition, that no one would stand in my way, that I would bury the shame under such deep piles of treasure that no one would see it, and so I yearned with a ferocity that needed soothing. The light wins once more! I cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. Four thunders uttered their voices, including from my new, terrible child body. The skin of my new body was as red as jasper, and my countenance as bronze melting in a furnace. I was now full of the knowledge of key stages 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and even 9, and my multitude of recounting eyes were endlessly rolling back in their sockets and clicking before re-emerging like miniature sunrises. Beautiful and terrible I spun, rising upwards, lighting and shining all around. Upon my forehead the name of shame, upon my forehead the name of anger, Upon my forehead also, the name of ambition. Up, and up, and up, and up I went, and as I propelled myself into the distant sky, I bellowed with a terrible voice as a great army of trumpets. Hairs, lashes, pupils were all aflame, and bathed the whole world in a red glow. And from the tens of hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of eyes in this body, I could see in all directions. Yes, now I could see everything. As anger swept across me, I could remember poverty and death, inequality and the scorching of the green earth, and the extinction of animals, and the virus that humanity had become. And a whole multitude of key stages could not defeat it, nor love, nor intelligence. Only phone, money, and keys. Who can you call? What can you buy? Which doors can you open? I shrieked into the pregnant, endless dark. And as the truth did sweep my three original bodies and my new one, my stomachs did grow bitter and heavy, and my Adam's apple did choke up and labour like an asthmatic and my countenance was that of Vesuvius. My new body was spinning and hovering, and I did rise up into the heavens until I clunked against the roof. A roof? The heavens had a roof? Was I stuck inside something? This was a world within a world, which must mean there was an outside. Perhaps London was outside, and perhaps the phone, money and keys were outside also. I wished I could have lingered, to question the serpents about what they knew, and to come to terms with all that had come to pass. But the shadowy flock of cups and strangers and objects had caught up, and I could hear them chanting, It was time to go. You will take me to the blue, I roared to the three snakes. And there I may find the articles I seek. Knife, fork and spoon did lay their heads down, and my three young adult bodies did each crawl into one of their mouths. Their scales expanded like chainmail sleeping bags. They lifted my bodies and spiralled faster and faster thereby propelling us along the face of the water, as if skimmed like a stone from Almighty ID's own palm. And thus did I abandon the bone ship of the Starman. 
My light shot from the mouths of the serpents like a terrible flaming pillar as I spun. My light also shot from the topaz stones encrusted about the bodies of the snakes, shining a universe of specked stars onto every surface. 